Graham, thanks so much for joining us for this interview. You're a gold medal winner, 2011, uh, from the Australian Institute of Architects. In 2012, you're awarded a member of the Order of Australia for your services to architecture. And these really reflect what a great contribution you have made to the profession. And so I'd really like to frame this discussion um, really about your experience as a young architect and then moving through into some of your seminal buildings, if I may. First of all, like, could you tell us a little bit about what got you into the profession of architecture? Well, I grew up in Hamilton and uh, my father was a builder. I sort of played around with that, uh, not enthusiastically, for about six years after leaving school at 16. Uh, didn't finish the matriculation as it was then, because they all thought I'd be more productive elsewhere. Anyway, after six years of, of fumbling around with the building trade, I decided I'd better do something serious with my life. And uh, there were a couple of uh, incidents which kicked me off, I suppose. One was some visiting um, Melbourne teachers, who teaching one of the local schools, so got meeting with them and they seemed to have a much more urbane uh, view of the world and certainly Hamilton was a very much an insulated place and quite a, a, um, a structured uh, social fabric, still the legacy of the old squatocracy and uh, the business sector of town being distinctly different. For instance, the old Hamilton Club, which was uh, started in about the 1880s, um, was still very much restricted after the war to membership of the local families. So anyway, I came to Melbourne at 22, uh, virtually penniless. Um, lived in a laundry in South Yarra. In the days that they were the days where there were mixed cultures in that area. Signed up at RMIT to do, I wanted to do a part-time course so I could work during the day and study at night. Was told that that was not possible so I signed up during the day on the punt that I would get some work somehow. So at the end of the third year though instead of going on to the part-time courses in architecture I thought I just had enough. I went away to Sydney for a holiday at the end of that year and met Peter Muller. We had a house next to his in Sydney on Wild Beach. And we got on very well to the point where I said, look, could I work with you? And he said, no, I don't have enough work to take you on. So I came back to Melbourne and then uh, within a week, Alan Nelson rang me and said, I'm over here at Grounds from Bergen Boyd. Would you like to come over? So he offered me the job and I went. And what work were they working on at that stage? Like one of these, you know, incredible firms of Australia? Well, one of the first jobs was Freddie Romberg wanted me to work on Newburn as an extension to go up another floor. That failed. They didn't get through Heritage on that one. Um, <laughs> and uh, then Domain Towers was being built and that had to be, because there was a change of personnel in the um, blend lease component, they decided they need to make some alterations and make the plumbing uh, much more efficient in its uh, al alignation. And so we had to redraw that whole building. There were a series of houses, and that's when I started working with Robin on the houses. Um, and there was one in... Uh, was burnt in the bushfires in Warrandyte, that's right, that was a replacement. There was a red drop house by the river in uh, at Yarra Bend, uh, which didn't go ahead because at that time it was 1961, that was a great downturn in the economy, so a lot of work did stop. And also on the McNichol house, which was in South Yarra in Caroline Street, which was a concrete block house with piers, uh, that was the um, sort of characterisation of the building, piers with windows between. So it was a highly indented building. And was there anything about that particular architectural studio that you think influenced your own practice? 
working with Robin was totally different to say working with Fred Romberg. Fred was an autocrat. Fred said, this is the way you do things. This is how you draw and these are the details that you go on producing forever. And Robin's was totally different. His was uh, sort of strategic in the way there was a problem. It needed a solution. So let's think about all the things we have. It was more inclusive. So it came up always with a different resolution. And that was much more inventive than anything else I'd been exposed to. So it was such an incredible firm. It was one of the seminal firms in Australia. What on earth led you to, to leave that practice and to start your own? The motive, um, uh, peregrination. Uh, I'd never stayed in places <laughs> very long. And in fact, uh, counting up the other day, I've lived in about 46 residences in Melbourne in 50 years. So I guess one of the most well-known projects from this period is uh, Winter Park, uh, 1969. It's a cluster housing model. Um, can you give us a little bit of information about how that project started and what it was trying to achieve? It was probably driven by David, who'd been to the States, uh, picked up on White's cluster housing program. You know, there had been the Radburn, which wasn't successful. Cluster housing seemed to be much more malleable and less uh, uh, rigid program. So could you perhaps just give a little bit more clarity about what the term cluster housing actually means? Yeah, it's really the, if you like, you take a piece of land and let's say it's large enough, which is the, the real thing. And it has significant features. I mean, it could be a creek, could be a mound, could be a hill, could be a great piece of vegetation over here. And rather than erase the lot and level it and fill in the creek and knock down the hill and chop down the trees, they become significant features in the planning of the world. So you plan and you put your houses, distributor houses around them to keep them, the semblance of them. And in so doing, I think uh, there becomes out, therefore, a much more natural and empathetic evolution of a building type and certainly of a uh, configurations of building to building. And that thing always appealed to me that it wasn't even now, I think buildings are still seen as an object on their own, and most architects get the buildings photographed that way. Um, they don't like landscape, they don't like people with their houses and all this sort of thing. So, Graham, this is perhaps a slight long bow. Um, I believe in around 68, actually, um, Elliston Park's also starting, and Daryl Jackson joins your firm. Um, where I'm leading with this is that um, the same period, there's the Plumbers and Gas Fitters building, which you undertake, which is considered a brutalist building, and at the same time you have Daryl Jackson doing the Harold Holt swimming pool. Was there something in the water at the time? Were you, did you go off and have a beer and talk about where architecture was moving? No, Daryl didn't drink much anyway. When we did Elston, David said to me, look, well, you've been the sole architect up to now, but this is a big project because we're talking about I think it was 80 plus houses. So I said, do you mind if you get some other architects? So I said, no, I didn't mind. So uh, I used to think then that you should really share things around. And so that's when I asked, I was told to nominate them. There was Darrell, there was David McGrath and Neil Everest and Charlie Duncan. So we had early meetings about setting up a process by which we could uh, develop buildings which were diverse and different but had compatibility. Um, so we did strive very hard to get together on something like that. It was more about ultimately choosing identifiable and um, not really similar but uh, compatible elements and they would would uh, have a dialogue with themselves, but the form of the buildings could be different. Uh, it was simplistic, but that was the way it went. And it was, uh, Charlie was the only one that reverted to form all the time <laughs> because he was a, very much uh, a devotee of Frank Lloyd Wright and or, or organic architecture. His, uh, it, his was different. 
But that was also not cluster housing, that was a normal subdivision. It was just that it was probably very laid out well and um, it was also backing onto the old golf course park with a creek at the bottom. So it did have that, those pedestrian and recreational qualities attached to it. Yeah. Getting on to then, that's when I first probably got to know Daryl Moore, because we were both building up our practices. And um, I think that we had no discussions over either the, those two jobs, the plumbers and gas fitters and the, and the Harold Holt pool. No, there's no discussion over that. We never talked about concrete. And it wasn't until we both did them that they appeared, I think. Can you give us some context about how the Plumbers and Gas Fitters building was awarded to you? It seems quite a different project from your other previous um, housing style projects. I had done a lot of brick buildings by then. Uh, at least burst a lot of buildings, not necessarily done them, but a lot of buildings had emanated out of that first blush with merchant builders and also some private buildings as well and probably one that set me off thinking very differently was the house for Irvin Rockman who was, wasn't Lord Mayor at the time but who was going towards Lord Mayor and his young wife who was a model and uh, I'd been working a lot with second-hand bricks and that house which is next to Wall Street of Robin Boyd's was built and it was very dark inside and uh, I must admit at that time I certainly affected the way I, I started to view uh, architecture and the ambience that it can create with, with the different forms of material. Even though I'd also been working by that time with uh, exposed concrete block for since the Richardson House would have happened before that, Molesworth Street happened. Although Molster Street might have well um, moved me off concrete blocks at the time because it did have some waterproofing problems. And it obviously, uh, in terms of the, the current vernacular, wasn't a great seller because it was a bit raw. And uh, I, I think, in fact, the first uh, purchaser was from Sydney. Um, it seemed to me that they were a bit more advanced in terms of their reception of those sorts of materials. And so that, that, that brings you into this, um, the plumbers and gas fitters then, so... No, the plumbers and gas fitters were, again, a reaction against the brick. Uh, it didn't seem to me right that you need another brick building in the city. It didn't seem to be very urban um, in terms of uh, reflecting what the city was all about. And I'm just trying to think, but at that time, yes, ICI would, would have been done because that was late 60s. Late 50s, yeah. No, no, late 50s. Yeah, it would have been finished earlier than that, I think. And so uh, I've not had a great um, affection for glazed buildings um, anyway, but at the time it just seemed to me that there was this chance with a little building next to the Trades Hall uh, to make some sort of statement about the assertiveness of the unions or otherwise, or the singularity of purpose, and uh, to get something that was unique for them. And to me, it was all that potential to really take on a single building, which it was, without had the context of a the terrace house on one side, the lane and the trades hall on the other. So there was a disparity between in its context. Uh, but it became a piece of sculpture to me to just take the block and uh, work it to the point where it expressed its function and it looked after itself in terms of um, thermal control. It, it planned uh, uh, as efficiently as I could with just the toilets and the wet areas down one side so all the floor was free and it had one meeting room which pokes out as an eyeball at the at the front so it, it fell together and it, it actually the worst thing was documenting it in those days and building it 
Can you recall what the public reaction was to the building? Or indeed what the profession's uh, reaction was to this building? Um, I don't really know how... I can imagine what the public would have thought. I, I can't answer that question. It, you, <laughs> it's it's just uh, sometimes I like it and sometimes I don't, and it's done anyway. So um, it obviously has affection for some people. Um, but it's interesting when when we're going through the, this preliminary around the notion of what's what's brutal architecture and what's not. Just because it's concrete doesn't make it good. It, and it could be brutal, but that still doesn't make it good either. So I'd still classify buildings as whether they are good at lots of levels, not just in use of its one material. Uh, and it's, I'm afraid there's probably a bit of an overemphasis on the fact that because it's concrete and brutal, it's terrific. But I don't necessarily think so.